Welcome, friends. It is the first Sunday in September, September the 5th. Tomorrow is Labor Day. I hope you all have a great Monday off. I know some of you are at the beach having the last hoorah of the summer and football season has happened and we're just so excited about it and, and uh, so we're glad that you're here today. Friends, next Sunday right here in Florida United Methodist Church, we're going to have Willie Santiago from Cuba. We're so excited to have him. We're glad you're here today. You will see Willie next week on this video if Willie gets here in time and we can get our video done. I hope to introduce Willie to our, to our Facebook and our YouTube congregation. Thank you for being here. Friends, I'm so excited. I know you got your, your uh, songs in the, in the mail this week and you're able to look over that. Those are my go-to psalms. I read those a lot. I read them when I get in trouble. <laughs> and, and so you say, how come you don't have more psalms that are just uplifting and praiseworthy? I said, well, the way, the way my life goes, I, read, I get in there and read those down and dirty psalms, those psalms that you really feel and, uh, when, when times are tough. And, we have, and most of the psalms are that way. And, uh, of course, there's Psalm 100, which is just uh, an outline for our morning worship, or Psalm 150, which is that last exhortation just to praise the Lord. So, uh, but I gave you the Psalms that you need to go to when things are looking tough. Friends, thank you so much for being here. It's a blessing to see you this morning right through this camera. We have Harlan Powell this morning that's going to sing He's from Yazoo County, and he is, joins us. We're, we're just about eight miles south of the county line here in Madison County, but Harlan is part of our congregation. You may know his daughter, Sandra Cartwright. She's one of our resident artists, and she has that, that gift. And she's also in uh, some movies. She, she's an actress, and, and she's in some great Hollywood productions and uh, Hopefully you'll see her here, and she does art in our church, and she acts on the side. Friends, I'm so happy you are here this morning. We're going to rock it old school today, old school gospel song with Mike and Harlan. Guys, y'all take it away. I'm going to live the life I sing about in my song. I gotta stand for the right and always shun the wrong in a crowd or alone on the street or in my home. I've gotta live the life I sing about in my song. Any day, anywhere, you might see me saying a prayer. Some may watch me, some may spot me, say I'm foolish, but I don't care. I can't sing one thing and then live another, be a saint for a day, oh Lord, a devil undercover. I've got to live the life I sing about in my song. If it day, if it night, God knows I must always walk in the light. Some will take me, some will rate me, cause I want to do what's right. Well, I can't go to church and shout all day Sunday, go out and act a fool and raise hell all day Monday. I've got to live the life I sing about in my song. i got to live life I sing about in my song. I've got to stand for the right and always shun the wrong. In a crowd or alone, on the street or in my home, i got to live the life I sing about in my song. i got to live life I sing about in my song.
Thank you, Mike and Harlan. Thank you so much. What a blessing. Friends, if you have your Bibles, let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You remember these two letters to the church at Thessalonica. And uh, going, going up north, going into Greece, and the church is spreading. And uh, the first letter talks about the second coming, and it causes so much a stir that they write a second letter to Thessalonians, to the, to the church there, to correct the idea. They, they had it in their minds that Jesus had come, and they had been left behind. <laughs> and so Paul has to calm them down. In fact, there's probably floating out there a third letter, which came after the first and before the second. Uh, but we, we're not quite sure. But there was a good bit of panic in uh, uh, St. Paul calming people down in the second letter to the Thessalonians. But he talks a good bit in the first letter about the second coming of Christ. And so I'm not going to preach a second coming sermon. I'll, I'll have one after Thanksgiving that I'll share with you as the Lord leads. But uh, I, I want to hit on this one because I think that this letter... And this portion speaks a lot of what I want to say about the time that we're living in right now. So I'm going to read the entire chapter. It's only 24, 25 verses. But as I read it, uh, there will be uh, statements that I think are really going to help us. It's going to bless us and challenge us and inform us. And, uh, and there's a, a, an entire passage in here that seeks to answer the question, how shall we then live? The great Francis Schaeffer, a Calvinist theologian and discipler of, of young people all over the world from his, from his enclave in Switzerland, and he made such a difference. He, he asked that question, the very penetrating question, how shall we then live? You may know his son, Frankie. Uh, Francis is long gone with the Lord, but Frankie was his son who has just sought to just destroy his daddy's life's work. He, he ran his car into a ditch, but his father and his mother were just so wonderful. His mother wrote a book called Christianity is Jewish. It's a great, great idea. It helps us understand uh, the new covenant in light of the old covenant. But right now, let's just take our Bibles. We you had time now to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It's the very last chapter of this book, of this epistle. And uh, it sets the stage, and then it asks and answers the question. So let's just start with verse 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you have no need that I should write to you. I'm reading from the New King James Bible this week instead of the NIV. I, I prefer it at, at this point. Uh, uh, for today, J just for today. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night. Jesus coming like a thief in the night. But when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor planes come upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. That's interesting, isn't it? He said, when you hear the politicians, the leaders of the world, say peace and safety, uh, like they might say, uh, we're getting out of Afghanistan is all and all is well. <laughs> and then sudden destruction comes. You know the end is near. Holy cow. It's like Paul was watching CNN or Fox News before he wrote this. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. We're not in darkness, brothers and sisters, so that this day should overtake us as a thief. You know, Jesus comes as a thief in the night and he surprises everybody, but he doesn't surprise the people who are ready for him. That's, that's, uh, that's the truth, I think, that gets buried in all of this apocalyptic uh, frenzy that, that we see around in the church. You are all sons and daughters of light and sons and daughters of the day. We are not. We are not of the night, nor are we, are, nor are we of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep, and let us not just, you know, trifle away our time as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep or those who relax, 
uh, they sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let those who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of hope and the hope of salvation. He's recalling, you remember, his letter to the Ephesians. So if that rings a bell, that also, that imagery also shows up in Ephesians. For God did not appoint us to wrath. It's not our destiny. Hell is not our destiny. So we don't have to fear that, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort one another with these words, just as you just as I know you are already doing, is what he says. Now, in light of those theological truths, in light of that biblical revelation, how should we then live? And this is how he answers that question. Look at verse 12. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you, like this praise band, like this team we have here, like, like your pastor. I'm I, you know, I'm not reading myself into the text, but it's, it is what it says. And are over you, that is, provide covering for you in the Lord. Your pastor's not your boss, he's your spiritual covering. He's here to bless you, to pray for you, to keep the devil off of you, that kind of thing. He's the shepherd that leaves the 99 and goes for the one. And to esteem them, your spiritual leadership in your church, very highly in love for their work's sake. And be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are unruly. Hey, y'all settle down over there. Jesus is coming. That's what, he, that's what he meant. That's what he says. Just tell people, settle down. Get it together. Jesus is coming soon. Comfort the faint-hearted. Uphold the weak and be patient with everybody. You know, we're not all at the same level, are we? Some people really have a strong and vibrant faith, and some people are just clinging to, to, to the Lord with all they have. And, and I've lived in both camps. And so he says, where, and he's speaking here to the church, not people who are, who are in the world, you know, on a path to uh, destruction, but in the church. Be patient with each other in the church. We're not all, not all at the same place. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for everybody else. Good for yourself and for the greater good. In the church, in the church. Verse 16, two words, rejoice always. Verse 17, three words, pray without ceasing. Verse 18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Then verse 19, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, do not quench the Spirit. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Don't put the Holy Spirit's fire out is what he says. Do not despise prophesying or prophecies or prophets. Do not silence the prophets in your church. Test all things and hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every appearance of evil. And then verse 23, after these, after these exhortations and admonitions, these uh, imperatives as scholars call them, it ends with this blessing. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly, completely, totally, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Brethren, Paul writes, pray for us too. Greet each brother and sister with a holy kiss. And that's a hug or a handshake. Uh, or maybe a peck on the cheek or on the, or on the forehead. So that's not something to be... <laughs> to be read in any kind of surly way, uh, or not surly, but uh, any gratuitous way. Uh, Greet each brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be 
read to all the holy brethren. I'm reading it to you today. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. Amen. Friends, I just tell you that uh, we live in so much conflict, and I can tell you this. I am a peace-loving man. I'm not the Prince of Peace, but I love the Prince of Peace. And The Scripture says, blessed are the peacemakers, not the peace breakers. And I love peace. I loved a good fight when I was, I was up for it when I was a young fellow. But I tell you, fighting and arguing is a young man or a young woman's thing. That's a teenage thing. Or maybe that's a, the, you know, the, the surly, I go back to that word, surly 20-year-old that wants to always have a fight or something. I don't care for it. I don't like fights in the church. I don't like fights in my home. We square off every now and then. I do not like fights in the family. I don't like fights anywhere. I like boxing, but I don't care for that MMA stuff. I don't care when they just put you in a cage and the, and the ideal is for you to kill each other. I don't see any sport in that. But, uh, but we have so much conflict in our world, you know, political conflict and then and there's all of this wokeness and the CRT and all of this stuff that is just horrifically bad. This critical race theory, which does nothing, but it pits one group against another group. It makes people hate each other, and it digs up old wounds, and it rips scabs off of old wounds, and it makes people into, it demonizes one group of people, and it infantilizes another group of people, and it says this group of of, of people, they're dumb and they're stupid and they can't do for themselves and so they need, uh, uh, you know, uh, white liberals to come in and speak for them because they can't speak for themselves and they're not allowed to have their own opinions and that it's just such an awful way to treat human beings. And so it causes conflict and just another conflict that we don't need. And, the, the you know, what happened in Afghanistan, I was... Uh, poking at it just a few minutes ago, but what happened in Afghanistan is just so unseemly and so unnecessary, and, and the carnage that's taken place there, you remember at the end of the Vietnam War, a million Cambodians were killed by the Khmer Rouge, and that kind of thing is happening already over there, and our politicians, you know, would just look in the eye, look in the camera, and and tell us a lie. He don't even know he's lying to us because he's just barely reading off of uh, off these uh, teleprompter, you know. And he's just so way out there. It's just so sad. It's just so pathetic. And and people tell us, you know, I hear that people say this all the time. I don't know if it's true or not, but they say we have the government we deserve. And I don't know if that's true, but I fear that's true. <laughs> And that just causes me some, some sleepless nights. But, uh, but where the battlefield is really taking place, friends, is, is in our minds. The battlefield, as Joyce Meyer said one so, so, so well, I know people hate Joyce Meyer, but she's so right about so much. She said the battlefield is in your mind, and, and there's no doubt Yogi Berra said 90% of the battle is half mental. <laughs> I think Yogi's right. I don't even know what he meant. And, uh, but it certainly is, it certainly is uh, horrific, the battlefield of the mind. And, and so we have to be mentally right to go forward. And friends, we need the church to lead the way. It seems like the church is always coming behind. When, we're not quite leading the way like we're supposed to. We come behind and we clean up the carnage. And uh, uh, Martin Luther King said the church, when the church is at its best, it is a, a thermostat. It can raise the temperature. If the, if the culture is too cold, it can raise the temperature. If the culture overheats, it can bring the temperature down. When the church is at its worst, it is merely a thermometer. It just reflects what the, what the greater culture is. And I'm afraid that uh, he was right about that. But I believe that uh, we're going to see the church at its best. And I know we will if we listen to the word of God, the words of God, 
in, in passages like this one and so many others in the epistles. Because they're in a really, they're in a, a, a culture, just an existential cultural war for their survival in all the epistles, in all the epistles. And Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica in both letters about the second coming of Christ. And so it's not that these words were relevant 2,000 years ago, but they're not relevant now. In fact, I would argue that these words are more relevant now as we've come closer to the eschaton, closer to the end. And so he's, he's teaching us how to live, and he's speaking to us in, in bullet point sentences, and he's not wasting his words. He's using short sentences like, Pray without ceasing, like rejoice always. Saying words like this, this is so important. He's, he's getting us to get our attitude right. Be joyful, pray always, and give thanks for all things. And so that's not easy to do. In everything give thanks, he says, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And so the church of the Lord Jesus Christ should wake up. Maybe the morning after uh, an election or the morning after a uh, national tragedy or the morning after a personal tragedy and say, say something like this, Lord, I don't feel like worshiping you. I don't feel like praising you. But because your word says in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning me, that's what I'm going to do. It's hard to give thanks for everything, but when he says give thanks in everything, I think I can understand that a little better. It's like Daniel giving thanks in the lion's den, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego giving thanks in the fiery furnace. They're not really happy to be in the fiery furnace, but while they're in there, they might as well get their praise on. You see what he's saying? It's very, very, very important. And so we need to face each day as the people of God like Paul is speaking to us in this epistle. And friends, can I tell you what God is calling us today? I, I, I want to, I'm probably jumping ahead a little bit in my, in my sermon. Maybe I'm going to, maybe I'm just shortening it. I don't know, but God is calling us to live with a certain virtue and it's a virtue that we that we don't readily embrace. And it's, it's a virtue that we cannot embrace without the Holy Spirit. I love that passage. It said, in everything give thanks. It says, rejoice always. It said, pray without ceasing. And then it says, do not put out the Holy Spirit's fire. Quench not the Spirit. Friends, can I tell you, I cannot tell you how many times I've been in churches as a guest evangelist or, or as a missionary or as a camp meeting preacher or, or doing retreats or those kinds of things. I've, I've preached so many times in so many places, friends, where the glory of God just fell and the fire was falling in the building and people are, we're just witnessing miracles or we're witnessing the power of God and then somebody comes along and they want to quench the spirit. They want to put it out. They come into church and they're so bound by their traditions of what church should look like or what church should be like. They want to come into church at 5 after 11 and then leave at a quarter to 12 and go by the bulletin and have, have, a, have a, a, a duet and then a sermonette and then a cigarette and then go home. <laughs> and... And then that's church, and they just check that off. And, and Paul is writing to us, not just to the Thessalonians, but to us. And he's telling us that as we get closer to the end of time, as that day approaches when Jesus is going to come again, that we need to pray without ceasing. We need to give thanks for everything. Thing. We need to rejoice always and we need to embrace the Holy Spirit. It's power and it's fire. 
Friends, any old body, any old body can go to church and have church and read the bulletin and read the liturgy and sing the hymn. And, you know, you get to the end of the service and the preacher's dragging on and you just won't hurry up. Would you just hurry up already and get through with your sermon? Listen, I've done that. I've done that. I've sat in church all my life. Listen, I know what it is to just go to church and be bored out of your mind. And then finally the preacher says, uh, let's take our hymnal and let's, let's sing the last hymn, the, the hymn of invitation. You know that? And people start, you know, making noise. You can see, hear them putting their jackets on, rattling their keys, getting their stuff together. It's like the two-minute warning at a football game. We've reached the very end of the service thank God the preacher finally got through and then and then he gets up there and he sings let's sing the first and the last verse and you say hallelujah but if he says let's sing all four verses you say dear God I cannot believe we got to sing all four verses yeah yeah It's not always your fault. I mean, a lot of times it's my fault. I'm just dull as dust. But friends, can I just tell you this? That, that Paul said that we really need the Holy Spirit as we go into the end of the age. We need the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Did you catch that? I think you, we might have just read too fast. I, I didn't pause when I got there. I just sort of blew past it, but... I hope you caught that. He said, quench not the Holy Spirit. And he said, despise not prophesying. You know, you know what a prophecy is? When, when, you know, a lot of people don't believe in prophets. I have a preacher friend. He doesn't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. He says, they're all for the old days. There's no prophets anymore, brother. That's what nonsense. God doesn't speak anymore. We have the Bible, so God doesn't speak anymore. So God has something to say to them, but he doesn't have anything to say to you. They don't believe that God speaks today. That's, that's what a prophet does. He just speaks, he speaks a relevant word into the current situation. He speaks for God. Sometimes he speaks from Scripture. He never speaks uh, instead of the Scripture or counter to Scripture, but he does speak to a relevant word in due season. That's what a prophet does. And my preacher buddy, he says, uh, God doesn't speak anymore. That's a dispensation for the early church. It passed away with John on the Isle of Patmos. That's interesting because John didn't die on the Isle of Patmos. <laughs> he had a post-Patmos ministry, but don't let the facts get in your way. But that same preacher will stand up before his congregation and he'll say, uh, the Lord has spoken to me. Oh, really? <laughs> and he's told me that it's time to draw my ministry to a close here at First Methodist Church of Bug Tussle, Alabama. And it's time for me to move on. And I've been called to a church in, in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. Yes, we feel the Spirit leading there. Okay, I, listen, I believe you, I believe you. It had nothing to do with the, the fact the church in New Orleans was four times larger and you tripled your salary and you got and your kids got into a better school. It had nothing to do with that. The Lord led you there. I'm not picking on you for that. I'm picking on you for this. What do you mean the Lord spoke to you? If God doesn't speak today, how come he spoke? Well, he does speak to us when he wants us to move to a larger church with a bigger salary. Okay, I didn't know. I didn't know. God forbid that he should speak to a broken woman who, who's, or a hurting uh, uh, child or to a couple that's going through a divorce. God forbid that he should speak to them, but he only speaks to you, and it's only to move you into a wealthier neighborhood. Come on, preacher. Don't play those games. Either God speaks or he doesn't. And Paul said he speaks, and he speaks prophetically, and he speaks it with, with relevance to the certain situation. And he said right here that when God speaks prophetically into a congregation, that some people in that congregation will despise it. You know, Jezebel hated the prophets. And 
and the prophets are still doing their thing, and so is Jezebel. <laughs> oh, friends, can I tell you that God has a message for you? The Bible is what God said, it's logos, but prophecy is rhema. It is what God is saying. And God's speaking to you right now. He is. He's got a word for you. God, is, don't despise that. God speaks prophetically to us, relevant to our lives. One day the Lord spoke to me and he said, I want you to go to Cuba. And I just, it just fell into my heart. And now I've been 20 times. How did that happen? God doesn't speak today, brother. Yes, he does. Oh, no, that's the devil. So the devil told me to go to Cuba, preach the gospel, feed the hungry, clothe the naked. That was the devil that told me to do that. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my. My, don't get me started. I'll, I'll go all day. Friends, God is speaking to you today. He speaks through his word, and he speaks through his prophets. He speaks to you through a still, small voice as he spoke to Elijah, and he's speaking to us right now. And while many churches in this denomination, in denominations across the world, especially across America, are shutting down, we're building up. We're going forward. Because God has spoken to our church here. Right here in Florida, Mississippi, population 1,600 people. God has spoken to us. And he said to us, full speed ahead. <laughs> we're not blinking. We're not flipping. We're not flying. We're not fleeing. We are moving forward in Jesus name in Jesus name and so don't put out the spirit's fire listen to the spirit's voice test what God has said to you in the scripture because if God has spoken to you prophetically it will hold up in precept in the Bible and and trust in the Lord and and this is what God has called us to, and I've read all of this, and I'm moving us to this, to this one point, and we'll be through. It won't be a long sermon today. We'll be through. This is what I believe God is speaking to our church. This is what I believe God is speaking to you. And this is what I believe God is speaking to the church around the world. God is calling us, friends, to courage. Friends, we have... We have, uh, we have embraced fear as, as a virtue in our world today. And, and to tell you the truth, I'm just annoyed by it. It's not that I'm oblivious to fear. It's not that I can't be afraid. I'm afraid all the time. I don't, I'm not whistling. I don't whistle past graveyards. I run through them. <laughs> but, but friends, God has called us to be courageous. And, and people all over America and all over the world have decided that fear is virtue and courage is foolishness. Courage is folly. And friends, can I tell you that, that if we adopt fear as a virtue, then we're going to be uh, woefully unequipped to handle life in these last days, preparing for the coming of the Lord. I'm just going to ask you, friends, I know that I'm offending a lot of people. I know that I might be offending most, you know, I might be offending everybody. But we need to man up, woman up, and we need to move forward with some courage. Friends, Courage is not wisdom. I mean, uh, fear is not wisdom. And courage is not folly. God has called us to trust him. He has us in his hands. He said he would handle this. He would hold us 
Did you catch that? Let me read it to you again. I, I said, I, I don't know, maybe I read too much scripture to, today, but look what he says. He says in verse 24, he who calls you is faithful who will also do it. God's going to get us. He's going to keep us and he's going to see us through this. Let's rise up and let's move forward. Come on, everybody. Come on, church. Come alive. Don't put out the fire of the Spirit. Don't quench the Spirit. Don't despise the prophets. Don't quit praying. Don't quit believing. Don't quit worshiping. Don't quit coming to church. Don't hide in your basements. Don't, don't freak out when you see somebody walking down the street without a mask on for heaven's sakes. Come on, people. Let's rise up. We are the people of God. Let's lead the way. Let's lead the way. Let's show the way. Friends, let's don't follow the culture into the ditch. Let's lead the way to the way, the truth and the life. Let's follow Jesus into victory. When Jesus comes again, friends, he's coming for us. He's coming for a bride. Uh, a bride that's going to go out and meet him. Not one that's hiding in the dressing room. Come on. Come on. You say, what if I exercise courage and I die? You're going to die. You're going to die. What makes you think you're not going to die? You think being a coward will extend your life one minute? It will not. It will not. It will not. Rise up, O oh men and women of God. Let's lead the way. Let's lead the way. Let's courageously live our lives outside and out loud. Let's bring the gospel. Let's bring life into our dead culture. Let's, let's change our cities. Let's change our counties. Let's change our states. Let's change our nation. Let's change our world. Come on, people of God. Let's get up and get with it. Friends, let's... Let's, let's don't be afraid anymore. Let's have some courage. Rise up, O people of God. Rise up. Rise and be healed. Rise and be courageous. Rise and be free. Shake off those chains. Shake off those chains. Shake off those heavy bands. Lift up your holy hands. Let's go, people of God. Hallelujah. Courage. What is a prophetic word for the church today? Despise not prophesying. What is God prophetically speaking into the church today? Courage. Courage. All right. We're not going to have another song. I'm going to pray for you right now. Uh, I feel uh, a need to pray for money for you. I want to pray for your finances. Uh, if, you, if you can, if you're not embarrassed, I don't know why you would be. You're probably by yourself or with your husband or with your wife. I want you to reach behind you or into your purse and grab your wallet. That's mine. Hold it in your hands and pray with me. And then we're going to pray for your health. We're praying for your money, praying for your health. And what I want you to do when we pray for your health is take your hand and put it on whatever hurts. My knees are killing me. Put your hands on your knees. My head is killing me. Put your hand on your head. I'll, I'll direct you into prayer. And then we're going to pray for your heart, for your spiritual life. You just put your hand just like that. You ready? Let's pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, we just praise you. You just called us, Lord, to be courageous. Lord, we see in just today in today's paper, we saw where Canadians have been arrested for going to church on Sunday. It's now against the law. And we think of, Lord, in California, where we had pastors and Christians in California who've been arrested for going to church. 
And Lord, I'm alarmed by that. And I'm alarmed at how, how many of us would just forsake our civil rights and give up our civil rights, our First Amendment rights, just because we're afraid. Lord, I, Lord, I think of businesses who have closed and they're not coming back. And I think of the trillions of dollars our government that has spent Two trillion in Afghanistan and trillions and tr thirty trillion dollars in debt right now, Lord, and businesses are not coming back. And Lord, for a many people, just having enough money to make it through uh, this week or to make it through today, Lord, they're just so desperate, Lord. People just. They need jobs, Lord. And people have become have come to trust in the government more than they trust in their own two hands to provide an income for, for their families, and that money has disappeared. And Lord, we we are concerned about that as the people of God. But Lord, your word says, King David said, I've been young and now I'm old, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. So I pray right now, Lord, for everyone who's watching this morning who has a financial need. Senior citizens living on fixed incomes, uh, uh, single mothers uh, trying to raise their families, uh, uh, married couples trying to pay tuition and house notes and car notes and, and just trying to survive in an uncertain time. Lord, I just speak peace and I speak abundance. And yes, Lord, I speak prosperity because although prosperity is considered a dirty word in today's religious culture, Lord, you are the God who prospers. You prosper your children and you promised you would and there is not one negative word about prosperity in the Bible. And so, Lord, I speak prosperity, not greed, but prosperity over everyone who's watching. I bless their pocketbooks in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray for those who are hurting in their bodies. Lord, you know that what I struggle with and stomach issues and, uh, and a foot issue, some nerve damage in my back, Lord. And, and so, Lord, I touch these places, Lord, where, I, where I've been hurt and right now, Lord, as my friends watching this, Lord, they put their hands over. Lord, some are having trouble in, in the brain issues, mind issues, Lord. Some with sight. Lord, some with just energy. And they don't know exactly where to put their hands, Lord. But I, I pray for those who have physical maladies, physical pain. Lord, I pray for those who are suffering physically. And I speak, I speak health and life, peace, and wholeness. Heavenly Father, finally, I pray for people who are disturbed emotionally. Lord, not that they have a psychological issue or something like that, Lord, but it's just the news. It's that steady stream of negativity that comes to us, and, and we watch just horrific genocide in Afghanistan and Lord those things take place all over the place Lord it we've had a genocide of sorts even in Cuba just 90 miles from from Florida from Key West Lord we think of uh, of uh, the slaves in China this it's the Uyghurs they're they're Muslims and they are being enslaved by the Chinese government and sent to prisons re-education camp and and Lord, we just think of those kinds of things. We think of the Taiwanese who live under the constant threat of destruction from China. We think of Hong Kong, Lord, and that once beautiful, proud city-state, Lord, and, and all of its wealth, it's just being destroyed now by the Chinese. And we think of, of uh, the, the pain and suffering that just takes place all over the globe. 
and all of the unrest. And Lord, how it afflicts us, how it afflicts our souls, Lord, and we internalize it. And we become afraid, and there's just so much unrest even in our own country, Lord. Chicago is a, is a weekly bloodbath, and, and New York is just so horribly uh, administrated, Lord, from their city hall and their city government that there are tens of millions of rats that have just taken over the whole city. We think of San Francisco, the once beautiful and proud and gorgeous place, the city on the bay. and We think of the Emerald City of Seattle, Lord, and we think of, of Hollywood and, and Los Angeles and just how, how it was a place of dreams not that long ago. And now people are fleeing these places. They're getting out as fast as they can, and it causes so much stress. And Lord, we wonder what's happening Lord, we know in our hearts that we're getting closer uh, to the end. We're getting closer to, to the second coming. Lord, your coming is, is soon. Lord, you're coming soon. And even, even uh, sooner than we could even imagine. And it's causing us some fear. And it's causing us, Lord, to recoil and, and, and even to retreat some as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Lord, I pray that we would reverse that trend, we would reverse that curse, and Lord, that we would just be blessed down in our hearts, Lord, that we would be courageous, and we would rise up like the people of God ought to, and we would lead the way, Lord. We would lead the way in national and international restoration that, uh, that we could be the hope and the light of the world like you called us to be. <laughs> Lord, it's going to take more courage than we've shown in the last 18 months. Lord, I pray for that one that's tired of living in fear. And they don't know who to listen to. Do you listen to the right wing? Do you listen to the left wing? Do you listen to Fox? Do you listen to CNN? Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name that every voice would be silenced except for yours. And we won't listen to Fox or CNN. We'll listen to you. Lord, forgive us for quenching the Spirit and for despising prophecy. And Lord, I speak over every person who's listening to me today, Lord. I speak courage. I speak courage. I speak courage in Jesus' name. Just receive it right now in Jesus' name. I speak courage in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Friends, thank you for joining us this morning. I hope to be here with Willie next Sunday, or maybe you'll be here and you'll get to meet Willie. Willie Santiago, he is uh, the best person I've ever met. And what you see is what you get with Willie. And he's just so unbelievably courageous. And he has given his life for the kingdom in Cuba. And his impact is around the world. Just a simple guy, a simple man with a pure heart. What a difference he makes. Uh, has many, many, many fears. Has been arrested many, many, many times. And he lives his life with courage. All right. I'll see you. we got a prayer list right here. Let's pray on, friends. Let's pray on. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. I love you.